All right, bam, we're in business. So um, last time we did attacking the uncastled king, and we saw an example, which we can quickly go over again, just to refresh the memory. It, it's sometimes good to learn a few games by heart, because there'll be some key moments that apply to other games as well. Um, I think this is one game to, that's good to know by heart, because first of all, this is an opening that you might find yourself playing for white or black, right? Um, if you feel very spicy that day and you're playing white, you might play b4 and go for the attack, the initiative, like what we saw in the game. And if you're playing black, you might want to quell the spice um, and you'll want to know what to do. So just a quick review. Taking the pawn is good. Usually white will play c3 to get some more tempo. We already talked about tempo in an earlier lesson. Um, bishop a5 is a fine move. White gains more tempo by playing d4 because they're threatening to take on e5. So black kind of has to take it. They're sort of obligated. And here, after castling, which is also good for white, that's what you would want to do if you're going on the attack as white, um, black could choose among several different moves. The best move is probably this one that we didn't discuss. So I'll put a little exclamation point next to it so that if you are visiting this... Um, Later on, just trying to remember, you know, how do I play this attacking line, or how do I defend against this attacking line, you'll know this is a good way to do it. Um, the reason this move is good is illustrated well by the main line of the game. Because they played this one instead, and Steinitz, who was the, world, the first ever world champion, was able to cut off their castling and create trouble for them with bishop a3. Now if the knight was on e7, and they played bishop a3, then you could just castle. Yeah, no harm, no foul. That would all be good. So, the main interesting feature of the game is that after bishop b6, there's this queen sacrifice. First, they put pressure on f7. Yeah. That's thematic. And black tried to defend it with some kind of exotic move, which I'm going to mark as dubious. Um, <laughs> it really deserves a full question mark, but the reason I give it only this uh, less harsh evaluation is because this move is... Um, it's logical. Like, you'd like to finish your development. You want to give back a pawn when you're already up a few pawns to try to make it happen. But it just doesn't work. And the way it doesn't work is we take and start attacking the king in the center, which was our theme for last week. So, the reason I'm going through all these details and showing you again is because re repetition is good for learning, first of all. Yep. Um, I also wanted to highlight how it's good to try to create a narrative in your head about how the game went to help you remember it and to try to focus on the key moments and having someone guide you through what those key moments are is really valuable in my opinion so like here this is kind of a no-brainer move something you would want to do in your own game where you just bring more pieces to attack the king with tempo and if you can do that a lot of times a lot it'll often turn into a winning attack even if you didn't plan it from the beginning but the other thing to know is that eventually you have to make some kind of critical decision. Like here, if you back off with your queen, you're going to lose all of your attacking potential. So it's necessary to start seeing some, some deeper variations, which takes a lot of practice. And there's a pattern recognition aspect to it, which is why today we're going to look at more games. Okay. Not so much like hand-wavy explanation, more like concrete stuff. Sure. So anyway, um, they took the bishop, took the queen, and you remember this attack on the king where we just bring everybody to the party and hunt them down and then finally that's the end of the game even if this was a rook odds game like if this rook here was missing this would still be mate so it's another funny thing about this game um okay so that's all just review just a quick you know refresher on attacking the king in the center where the important features are like rapid development which is always important in the attack um sacrificing because we often need to sacrifice to gain like just a few extra moves to attack. And um, in this particular case, it's important that we trap the king in the center. You'll notice this bishop is trapping the king. This is blocking the king. That's all important stuff. So we will often attack on the open file towards the centralized king. But this is kind of different when we're attacking a king who's already castled. And that's our theme for the day. So, we're also going to look at some of my games, not like World Champion games or anything like that today. 
because I think attacking chess is something of a forte for me. That's it's probably easy to say, like, anybody who has, like, a nice attacking game probably feels good about it, and like, oh, this is what I'm good at. Um, but I, I think I managed to turn to create an attack out of situations where there's a very marginal room for error pretty often. So I, I do think I'm actually, like, better at it than other things. Um, so the themes of sacrificing, doing everything with tempo, running the king out, those things are still important, but it's going to happen in a different way. Um, let's just see the opening and then we can get to the part where it seems like attacking is going to happen. Okay. So I was playing white in this game. Mm -hmm. And all of these games I picked from when my rating was like a couple hundred points lower. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't do everything perfectly. There'll be some, some chances for you to maybe Im improve on what I did. Okay. Um, and this opening is what we played. Do you remember the name of this opening? Is it Italian? <laughs> no. Italian is, okay. is kind of like what happened in, in this game. Oh, yeah. Up to here is called Italian. I'll, I'll put a, okay. a note here. And then this becomes Evan's Gambit. Mm -hmm. So they overlap with each other. Yeah, I just saw E4 and I was like, yeah. Okay. Yes, Italian. That's E4 something. always. <laughs> Um, Every time I see an opening I don't recognize, I'm like, oh, is that English? And it's totally not English. Oh, man. Well, th this is actually pretty similar to the English. It's just with colors reversed. Like, English is yeah. could be this one. Yeah. Um, but this is, like, if you just rotated the whole thing and, and flipped whose turn it is. Mm -hmm. This is the Sicilian defense. And okay. there are lots of kinds of Sicilian, uh, but they all start with E4 and C5. Yeah, I n we never went over that before. I was just curious if you'd figured it out somewhere along the way, because I know you've been playing a lot of practice games and stuff. Yeah, I've like heard of the Sicilian, and I know it's like one of the most popular defenses mm -hmm. to play. Yeah, that's what I the girl plays in the Queen's Gambit series. So yeah. whenever I meet someone who has like just seen the Queen's Gambit and I tell them that they play chess, they're like, do you play the Sicilian defense? I'm like, yes, I do. Um <laughs> I play many defenses, that's just one of them. Certainly. Um, oh, another funny thing about the names of openings. It, it's been traditional for a long time to pl to call the black openings defenses and the white openings like a system or an attack or something that sounds like more appealing, honestly. Um, but really, in, in the modern era, if, if it's an opening, it means that it hasn't been already destroyed by computer analysis and it's probably equally attacking and defending for both sides. So it's not really... It's just tradition mm -hmm. to call out a defense at all. Sicilian is very uh, aggressive a lot of the time, and it often results in attacking positions just because of asymmetry. You, you might remember how um, we did some thought experiments where like, well, if we sacrifice these pawns, um, which ones would be the best for creating attacking chances? And it turns out it's the ones that make your pieces the most active, right? We, we gave up the center pawns in that thought experiment. And we did another one where we said, well, if these pawns are missing, um, whose king is more unsafe? Um, well, not whose king is more unsafe, but it's like, how bad How bad is it? That was one of our first thought experiments. And then we did a thought experiment where we said, if we move the pawns in front of the king when it's castled, how bad is it for them? Mm -hmm. So with all those things in mind, it kind of combines to give you hints about what's going to happen later in the game when somebody makes a pawn move. So if black makes a pawn move on the queen side, which way do you think they want to castle? Uh, king side then. Right, because when they castle queen side, they're going to be, you know, they're going to have fewer pawns nearby to protect them. So if we know for sure they're going to castle king side, that means we could start building an attack on that side of the board even before they've actually done it. So there's a lot more chance that we can actually just go all in and have a successful attack just from this first move. Yeah. Meanwhile, um, when white plays e4, how do you think that impacts their king safety? Not particularly. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't particularly impact it. The dangerous thing would be if the e-pawn gets attacked and then trades itself and then the e-file is open, then it will become kind of like that Steinitz versus Rock game. So this is how the attack sort of unfolds from the pawn moves. Um, okay, so we go forward. Knight f3 is a normal move, right? Normal, typical move. E6, maybe not the most normal move, um, at least from the standpoint of someone who just learned chess, because it controls the center, but it doesn't like 
stand firmly in the center. It helps develop a bishop, so that's all good. Um, but when you play a move like e6, it might reduce the activity of one of your minor pieces, this bishop. In my experience, when someone plays e6, this also often leads to attacking type positions. And one of the reasons why is that black might fall behind in development, trying to get that bishop out. So that's a sort of foreshadowing, maybe. Mm -hmm. In this opening uh, of this game, I chose to play c3. Mm -hmm. And we played one daily game for practice where I also played c3 in a different position. Do you remember that? It's okay if you don't. It's like a... <laughs> I saw this and I was like, wow, I, I always just put my knights there. Maybe I'll try this at some point. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, it's definitely much more normal to play a move like knight c3, and it's not a bad move in this position. So let's compare those two moves. Comparison is usually a good way to get a hint about like what people are trying to do. So normally when we play knight c3, we want to control the center, develop the pieces faster, right? So what could possibly be the reason that we would put a pawn on c3, blocking our own knight? There must be some benefit that's like at least equally good. Uh, allowing the queen to go up the left diagonal up to, okay. I don't know, a4 maybe? Or yeah. Just... The, the way that we call the diagonals is for their start points and end points, by the okay. way. Which is very okay. ungainly. <laughs> we'll say like d1 to a4 diagonal instead of like yeah. e-file or 7th rank, which are like a lot easier to say. Um, so we might say they're trying to go to a4, right? But I think black hasn't presented any targets there. Not yet. No. This, this could be a factor, though. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how I said multipurpose moves are usually better? Yes. So l let's consider how that's one purpose. What else could be a purpose for c3? Mm -hmm. So I see that, like... What it does is it creates this little pocket, and then mm -hmm. there's also this little happy triangle of mm -hmm. um, pawns on this thing. So I guess that also makes it less likely for uh, their I made bishop a face. over here to attack the, the rook, because I've seen this happen very often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could maybe st stunt their bishop or something. But also, it's controlling these two squares. Right, that's actually more important, because okay. we don't know yet like what their bishop is going to do. They will have to declare that themselves. Um, like, it could go on e7, or d6, or c5, or b4, or a3. Like We don't know eventually what's going to happen. Um, but what we do know for sure is that we control b4 and d4 right now. Mm -hmm. And one, one thing that I like to suggest to people is that when they're thinking of ideas, they should think of it as a move pair because that's, that's sort of a logical unit in chess. So if we play c3, it's intending to play something on the next move. So if it supports the squares b4 and d4, what do you think that next move might be? Maybe. I'm not sure which one is better, <laughs> but... We can since, figure it out, but... Yeah, since d4 is more center controlling, mm -hmm. I would probably pick that. Yeah. D4 is more logical on the basis that it's in the center. That's good. Mm -hmm. It also opens up this bishop, so it's more logical in that way too. And there's a third thing. So if we're just comparing B4 and D4, when you play B4, how many times is that square attacked? Uh, just one. Think again. Once, but it's also got a bishop behind it. Right, so it's two. Even though the bishop is attacking through the pawn. They don't have a choice, they have to take with the pawn first, but it's supported. So yeah, that square is actually not safe, right? Okay. We have one support, they have two. Yeah. So if we were doing that, that would be like a gambit. You know, we're mm -hmm. just giving it for free for development. And if that was the case, I would probably just play it straight away. I wouldn't even bother playing c3. Just play b4, let them have it, and then keep going. Um, maybe th the way that would look would be like, we go here, and they're like, mmm, greedy nom nom, and then we play like d4 or something like that. That would be maybe a more aggressive way of doing it. So when someone plays a move like c3, it's kind of hinting that they want to play d4, and they don't want to allow um, the pawn to trade and force a piece to occupy d4. They want to replace it with another pawn. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come to this more when we talk about strategic chess um, in a couple weeks. 
like strategic non-attacking chess, you know, middle game play, maneuvering, that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes it's good to have uh, a strong central pawn presence um, in order to have more space. But right now, since we're talking about attacking chess, um, we're not going to worry about that too much. We'll get into it more. If we had more sessions to build up to it, we'd, we'd definitely get into those basic things. But we don't need to. We'll do it the fast way. So knight f6 is what black played here, which attacks the pawn on e4. So we could either protect it, or we could try to do something more aggressive. So what would you do here? I just go e5. Yeah, e5 is definitely the more aggressive option and sets the stage for an attacking campaign. The knight has to move again, so we gained a tempo, right? We invested a pawn move, um, like so we technically moved our pawn twice and they moved their knight twice. So you might say like maybe it's evening out, but getting the pawn to e5 is something of an accomplishment because it restricts black's pieces. They might have to spend more tempo later in the game to maneuver around that strong pawn. But what they get in response, or I'm sorry, as compensation, is this good knight on d5. You might wonder, like, what's good about the knight? Well, it's centralized, and short-range pieces such as the knight, pawn, and king typically do well when they're centralized, but not the king until the end game because it's not safe to centralize your king in the middle of the game. Um, but, you know, the knight does really well, and the main concern for these short-range pieces is that they can't be chased away. You'll notice here that if white plays c4, that seems kind of silly. Like, you just played c3, you're going to play c4 again. And then that would weaken this d4 square that you were fighting for control of. So, like, why would you really do that? Um, in that sense, this knight is pretty snug, doing a good job on d5. And we'll talk more about outpost squares later on. I could even recommend some reading for you if you want to learn about it in the meantime. Um, we could talk about that later. Okay. So, um, let's talk about... Well, I'll just show the next couple of moves. We'll go a little bit faster. Bishop c4, finishing development, um, getting ready to castle, and disturbing the knight on d5. We don't necessarily want to take the knight, but it's nice to have the option. That's why I would choose this over, like, e2, which is maybe kind of slow. Yeah. They played knight c6, which is perfectly good. White castled, and that's me, so it's got to be good. Just kidding. Um and black played d6. So this shows the point of why black played the way they did in the opening. They allowed white to gain a lot of territory, but they want to tear it down. This is called undermining. They allow us to advance and then attempt to use the things that we advanced as targets. So how do you think we should deal with d6? They want to take the pawn on e5. Maybe we just go like, don't care and continue attacking how? In some other way. <laughs> I think that's that's my first instinct usually, which is probably why I'm something of like an attacking player. Um, I like to think I'm more well-rounded now, but you know, attacking definitely feels natural for me. I like to ignore what people are doing and just do my own thing. <laughs> so what would that look like for you? Um, I want to pin the, the knight on c6 by moving my bishop to uh, b5, but I know that there's an, a pawn kick that can just... Yeah, that's yeah. right. You'll you'll have to relieve that tension immediately. Th there's another way that they can do that. So let's say you play this move. We'll just play it for comparison. Th what you were suggesting is a6. This is our pawn kick. And we're either going to have to back it up and deal with more pawn kicking, which is probably not great. Going kicking and screaming back to c2. Yeah. Which is actually, it's convenient that we have that spot because we played c3, so that's definitely like an advantage of playing it, but that's not the main reason we play it. It's more like, right. just glad I'm not losing my bishop right now. Um, and the other thing that you could do is take this, and it'll double their pawns, which is usually considered to be not that great, but you'll notice that the, the pawn on c6 is also controlling an important central square. So it's not really a big deal in this case. Also, bishops are slightly better than knights in open positions. So if you trade your bishop for the knight early on, it's going to be hard for you to ever utilize that possible advantage in the end game when uh, okay. the bishop's long range powers will outperform the knight. That's okay. a concept we haven't talked about yet. Um, I could recommend a video that I made to explain open position versus closed position, um, but we can also save it for later. Yeah, so that's not so great. 
another thing that I want to point out is that this is a tempo loss. If we're attacking, or if we want to preserve the chance of an attack, we should probably not move the same piece so many times in a row. It's only twice, but it's at an early critical stage where we want to get more pieces involved. So when I'm thinking about attack, my instinct is to try to get these pieces all involved somehow, but also not run into their threats. Okay. So some good multi-purpose move. Sure. Uh, so since we've been building up to d4, is that the thing to do now? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's very logical that we should play d4. It supports the pawn, so if they take it, we can just replace it right away with the pawn, not with the knight. The reason we're replacing it with the pawn is if we... Well, first of all, it's doing the same good things that the pawn was already doing, restricting black's pieces. Um, also, this opens up the queen to have some kind of uh, influence on the d-file, potentially, so that's all good news. And... So the, the question would be like, why don't I take with a knight? Because they'll probably take this anyway, and then I'll still have a pawn on e5, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the difference here is that the pawn on e5 is going to be kind of vulnerable, and the simplification of the position, where like an extra, piece of, an extra pair of pieces has left the board, I think this favors black's opportunities for undermining that pawn, because okay. when somebody has a weakness, something that's stationary, can't ever really go away, like this pawn who's blocked on e5, they want to trade. So this is probably how you can calibrate your intuition. If I have a static weakness, I probably don't want to trade all the pieces. So the more complicated I keep it in terms of how many pieces are there, um, the more likely I will be able to create um, a successful attack, despite my weaknesses. So that's, that's how I like to think of it. So this way, we do have a weakness. We have a weakness either way. The, the pawn on e5 is both a strength and a weakness. It, it's a target in the end game, but right now it's restricting black's pieces. Um, but if they can trade enough pieces, it will be more weakness than strength. So, um, so that's good. In, my, in the game, they took on d4, and, and we took back with a pawn. So you can see the, the point of playing c3. We maintain that strong pawn presence in the center which means, in extension, we maintain this strong point on e5. And this kind of harkens back to our early example about territory. Do you remember how I showed some examples where it's like there's a knight and it's trying to come into your territory and you don't want to let them build up an attack so you have to chase it away immediately? You remember that part? So the pawn is kind of like a piece in the opponent's territory that they can't chase away. So it's an advanced support point for us to launch an attack in an abstract way. It's, it's not obvious looking at it that this is how the attack will build up, but you have to create problems for your opponent so they will go wrong so that you can attack. And if they have some difficulty like, oh, I can't put my bishop on d6 the way I want to because there's a pawn there, like this pawn attacking that spot, or I want to bring out my queen and do something like vis-a-vis -vis scholar me, uh, but there's a pawn in the way, not that, that's a knight, a pawn in the way, um, then this is going to be um, a problem for them, and they might eventually go astray as they try to deal with that um, negative influence on their side of the board. Okay, so they played bishop e7, I played knight d2, um, a better move here is knight c3. Yeah, so it doesn't block your bishop? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but back then I was worried... It's not exactly that I was worried. I also had some special uh, preparation. Uh, it, it wasn't good preparation, so I'd say it's more like an anxiety manifesting itself. Um, but the idea is that normally people play this move. This is very typical. And what people do in such situations is they will take and then take here and try to trade queens. And I didn't really want to do that. So I played knight d2 so that... I could move my knight again so the bishop gets out, but I don't trade any pieces. So I can keep attacking more easily. So that's why I did this one. And they answered by castling. And this is the, the real starting point. All that stuff was important because it, it sets the stage for like, why are we here in the first place? And why is this an attacking position? Uh, but this is the first moment where we can start thinking about how do we actually launch the attack on our opponent's position. So. 
um, when you want to attack, it's good to consider whether or not your opponent has done anything wrong in the opening. If, if they've done everything kind of correctly, usually an attack doesn't make sense because they should have enough pieces to defend their king, they should have good enough center control, they should be able to coordinate. So do you think black has done anything that's like objectionable in the first, uh, how many moves is this? Nine moves. Thing looks completely awful, but um, some of their pieces do look pretty blocked off. Like I don't think the bishops the bishops have much room to breathe. Which one do you think is worse off, the dark bishop or the light bishop? The light one. Yeah, for sure, the light one. This bishop is okay, actually. It doesn't look impressive, but mm -hmm. it's doing guard duty on g5, which we know is mm -hmm. like a classic invasion point, sure. and. Additionally, in the next couple of moves, they could take, take, and then have a view of this side of the board. Yeah. So even though it's not going anywhere, it's you know it's kind of annoying that it exists. But this bishop is definitely not so great. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the main feature that makes it uh, logical to start aiming for an attack. It's mm -hmm. not a huge error, but it is definitely something that you can kind of like push on, something that's weak. Um, so how do we highlight the weakness of that bishop? If you can't do it directly. Um, you're gonna have to try to improve your position and let them like struggle to get that one out. Um, here's a rule that might help you. So they've castled on the king side. So the way we're gonna launch the attack is not by like opening the center of the board and you know going for some crazy sacrifice immediately, like in the the Steinitz versus Rock game that we saw. Um, we're going to be a little bit more strategic about it. The rule that is helpful in these situations is the 3 to 1 rule. And what this means, it might even have another name, I'm not sure. Um, but the rule is that you want to have um, three pieces that can work together to give a checkmate. You need one piece to sacrifice, you need your queen, and you need a piece to support your queen. So it's like minimum you need three attacking pieces. And the reason I say three to one is that if they have more than like a third, like one to your three defending pieces, they will usually successfully defend. Okay. So in this part of the board, the king side, we can think of this as a quadrant if you want. Um, I never really think in quadrants, but I've heard that some people find this really helpful and allegedly Casper of the world champion thought about quadrants. so. If you like quadrants, you can do this. So if we focus on this region, um, and within it, they have a rook that's a defender, but it's only good at defending f7. It's not flexible enough to defend the other squares near the king. Sure. Um, well, it defends the back rank too, but that's not the kind of attack we'll probably have to go for. Um, they have this bishop, so we regard this as a defender. The queen is not a great defender, it's more like supporting the bishop to do his defending role. Right. This is a very qualitative rule, it's not like strict at all. We don't count the pawns exactly. I, I sometimes use a modification of this rule where I'll say like, if they have at least one pawn that counts as some kind of defender, like maybe a fraction of a defender. Um, so in this case, it's kind of like they have one defender. Mm -hmm. And how many attackers do we have right now on that side of the board? It doesn't have to be in the quadrant. It just has to have access to the that quadrant. Uh, so we have a knight, we mm -hmm. have a pawn. And then, I think that's it for now, but if we move the bishop a little bit that's on c4, then it can take a peek at h7 as well. Yes, it could peek. So, we have the trappings of an attack, but it's not ready. Mm -hmm. This is why attacking chess usually manifests as a building phase and then a striking phase. Um, in the building phase, you bring a bunch of pieces to try to get that ratio that's good. And you also want to have a good chance of the simple attack where you sack something, you bring your queen in, and then you check me with the support of another piece. Um, so we're still in that phase. That's what this analysis tells us. So how can we bring more pieces to the attack? So, so far I can see that this diagonal here is pretty weak. Uh huh. So I kind of want to bring like 
light bishop and queen to that location, but that's going to take too many turns. Mm -hmm. So maybe knight e4? Yeah, knight e4 is pretty logical. Um, let's say we play this move. I think that black would probably take here. So let's just examine this a little bit. Um, what would you be, what would you do here? Take it back with the pawn. Probably. Right with the pawn. Um, and let's say they go here. Mm -hmm. What well, what will your reaction be? Well, this is inconvenient. <laughs> it's inconvenient. Okay. A little bit. How come? Um, I mean, your idea was to not trade queens, but in this case, I would probably trade queens. You shouldn't. See if there's a way that you can avoid trading queens. And we'll analyze this a little bit more deeply. Keep in mind, they also want to take your bishop. Yeah. So we're looking for a multi-purpose move where we don't lose our bishop, but we don't trade queens. Yeah, so then I would have to go back to take uh, the, the bishop that's being attacked to d3. All right, good. Let's, let's flip the side here for a second. So let's pretend that we are on the defending side. We don't want them to attack us. Things are already looking very dangerous. They have one, two. It also has access to f6. Three attackers on the king side, three to one. So this almost looks like a successful attack in the making. Yeah. So what can we do right now to try to trade those attacking pieces. Usually trading is the way you get rid of the attacking potential. Black to play and try to trade some stuff. You can't do it on move one, so it has to be like a threat to trade. Right. I'm looking at the knights because they're the most open pieces yeah. right now. They're the jumpy boys. They're gonna be doing a lot right now in a close position. There's also, it also looks like there's a lot of potential for, like, fun fork situations. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't think this one is close enough to the action to do stuff right now. Not right now. No. This one has one, two, three moves that seem okay. Mm hmm I think you can rule out two of them. Yeah. Yeah, so... This one's being attacked, mm -hmm. and this one's also being attacked. Right. So then I would just move here. Yeah, and the reason this move is logical is they're trying to trade the knight who's not protecting the king side at all for the bishop that is attacking the king side. Right. And if you decline, like let's say you go like here, you're like, mm -hmm. no way, I don't want to trade, boohoo. Um, they can start trading other pieces, right? Like the queen. Right. And for the easy breezy, beautiful checkmate on the king side, you kind of need your queen. Yeah. So this is not really working. Um, so this is a sample variation for why um, it's not good to play knight e4 right away, even though it's the right idea. Attacking chess is hard in that sense, where it's like you, you might have several ways to do it, but only one sequence is actually good. So you have to calculate a lot. Um, I also want to mention something, just because it's fun. Um, there is a tactic here after knight d4. This is a big mistake. You said it's because they can take this one, but couldn't you take back? Yeah, I There's a problem with it, though. In two moves, um, black is going to lose their queen. Maybe three moves. I'm, I'm bad at counting, but like, there's a tactic here where every move is forcing. Yeah, so first I check with the knight. Yeah, let's say they take and it. And then check over here, mm -hmm. and then queen is free to go. Yeah, exactly, good. So this is what might happen. They could take, let's say take here, we take this, doesn't matter what they do, and the queen is hanging. Nice, good tactics. Um, <laughs> now the the maybe obvious thing is like, what happens if they just step to the side? Mm. In this case, I think we're also happy because we can um, go ahead with our attacking plan. This is a good example of the like three to one situation. Um, well, actually, maybe here it's not so good. I was just thinking about it as, like, I could maybe play, like, queen h5, but then there's 
queen takes d3, which actually protects the weak spot on h7. So this is almost almost working, I guess I should say. Um, you you could play knight takes h7 though. Mm -hmm. I figured you could play like there has to be something kind of reasonable here. Uh, maybe this is it. Um, but even then, maybe they'll go here. Mm -hmm. It's all very concrete. It's a little hard to tell sometimes, like what's going to happen. Yeah, I think this this particular example doesn't work out, but it, it, it really does almost work. Mm -hmm. So king h8 is a necessary defending move. So fun variation, but I guess it's not forced. You, If you wanted to play this as just a pure attacking position, you could maybe like throw in a developing move or something. Like you could uh, attack the queen with tempo, and even though they could take some pawns, we don't really care about material that much in the attack, right? right. So... Maybe we would play, for instance, they take here, and then you could um, maybe just take this one. And, you know, we, we keep playing chess, just try to annoy them until they die. <laughs> Alright, so this is a sideline, so we could focus on some other stuff here. Um, this is all sort of to show that knight e4 it's, a, it's the right idea, but the wrong time. So what else could we do to try to improve our pieces in this situation? So the rooks are looking a little bit sleepy. Mm -hmm. Sleepy rooks. If we're not moving yeah. the knight, definitely next is to think about the rook. Yeah, so the only move that makes sense to me now is rook e1. Yeah, that's right. So I chose rook e1, which is kind of preparing to improve the other pieces. Another move that makes a lot of sense here is queen to e2 which has an idea like playing rook d1. Since we saw some of black's counterplay involves taking on e5 and having the queen trade on the d file, we just switch our queen and our rook, kind of. So they're they're looking at something they don't really want to look at. A dangerous rook. So this is this is probably the best move in the position, but we can, we can go on. Rook e1 is good. They took, took, and played knight b6. Notice here that the knight is actually preventing the queen trade. So I, I played bishop b3 because I don't want to trade my attacking piece. And I can't put it on d3 because if I do, they'll just take it. Yeah. So this is why it's it's here. And they played knight b4. And I played queen e2, which is, which is good kind of not just to play rook d1, which would be slow now that we've committed to rook e1. Um, but it's good because it, it's eyeing some of these light squares, which will become important as we start building our attack more. It also prepares to move the knight because we don't want to trade queens. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is all reasonable for attacking stuff. Um, so even though black has improved their knights maybe and maybe improved their pawn structure in the last couple of moves, they're in a bit of a tricky spot. Um, what would you play here for black? I would probably go knight d3 because I was about to ask what happens if they do that's a very reasonable question let's look at it so if we if we play this the rook is hanging so probably we should not give it up mm -hmm. but when we're playing attacking chess we might also want to sometimes give up a piece for the attack yeah. so um, one variation that comes to my mind is like I attack the knight I force them to take the rook and then I go for the kill on the king side but just from looking at this position do you think that's going to work How come? Let's say I play like queen e4, you know, what could go wrong here? He can just remove this piece. Yeah, that's probably one thing. There's something that's even more critical though. Also this one? Yeah, that's the yeah, most important thing. Because yeah. we need that to give the checkmate. Mm -hmm. These kinds of variations, when you see them, you have to back up in your thoughts and be like, okay, this is a funny idea, but it doesn't quite work. And then you might take some elements of that variation and let it inspire other variations, but there's a lot of like going forward, no, that doesn't work, backing up, and then like going forward again. Mm -hmm. So probably here white has to play something that's not attacking for one move. So what do you think it should be? I want to move the rook. A little bit. Right. Where but to? I'm not sure what direction to move it in. 
Well, which one looks more active? Uh, Think about his long-term prospects. Yeah, so D1? Yeah, D1 looks better, because at least it looks at the, at the knight and the queen, right? Um, and we're not losing it, so that's important, right. too. Um, and now we're actually kind of pre preparing to play bishop c2, because without that move, knight takes e1 in the middle, the variation we just looked at might actually work. For example, well, here they already can't develop their bishop, because that would hang the knight, right? Mm -hmm. So if they play something... Um, like maybe trying to improve their queen. This, like I cringe to make such a move, honestly. Um, <laughs> they're probably going to lose a piece. Like we play this one, threatening to take the knight. Mm -hmm. They protect it some more, but then, um, what would you play here? I, I think we have a way to win material. Alright, so I'm just sort of going through both the knights to see if they have anything mm -hmm. interesting to do. Some people um, like to start with the lowest value pieces, then go to the highest value pieces, or vice versa, to like organize their thinking. So yeah, that sounds good. Okay. The most obvious thing I see is just take the, the knight with the bishop. Okay. I kind of want that to be there. Mm -hmm. I agree, because so, if, if they take back with the queen, you didn't win anything, right? It's just fair. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, otherwise, my pieces do look a little bit squished, so I think it would be nice to give them a little more space. But I'm not sure which piece to move or where. Um, so... Alright, I guess I'll start with this knight. Okay. So it has some room over here. But they all look pretty bad. Yeah. Also, that knight is not responsible for the squishiness of your position, right? Right. And then there's this one. And then he can go there. Mm -hmm. This one gets eaten by that. Yeah, so, so maybe not that. So now knight e4 actually looks alright. Yeah, I agree. You are also threatening to attack all these guys. The, this this move doesn't actually win material the way that I thought it did um, when I first looked at it, but it's very threatening. It's hard to find a defense. The best move for black is probably to take this and let you take the queen. Oh. Yeah, the reason is that your queen is also hanging. Right. So probably the best move for white is to take back, and they're, they're going to escape without losing a, a piece. However... We also forced them to make several moves in a row with the knight, which means we got a lot of tempo, which means our pieces are now fully deployed. So this is very promising for the attack. So they should also be sweating bullets here. Like, this is not a good position. Um, okay, so just an example of how there's some tactical chances here after knight d3. So it's a reasonable move. For instance, like, let's say we play rook d1, and they don't play something stupid like queen d7. That was just for demonstration purposes. Um, they could take this right away, right? Yeah. And what they've accomplished is they've destroyed a potentially dangerous bishop. Mm -hmm. It took them a few moves, but it's gone now. And they can breathe easy. For now. Anyway. So knight d3 is totally reasonable. The move that I was concerned about during the game um, was queen d3. The reason I was concerned is that I don't have a very active way of avoiding the queen trade. Yeah. So that's kind of dangerous. I would have to maybe do some pirouettes to um, keep the attack going. And at some point, it's good not to try too hard. Like, if the attack's not happening and you go for it, you're probably going to lose. So it, it, you need to have really good harmony. I think this would ruin that, that harmony pretty badly. Like, if I go here... Um, I think maybe rook d8 or a knight move or something. Like I think everything is probably fine for black. It's just about choosing the best one. They could even probably go back to g6 or f5, something like that. Um, meanwhile, I really wish I could like get my bishop here, my queen here, that kind of stuff, and it's not not working. 
So that would have been a pretty big setback. So queen c7, I would call a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I played knight e4 because for all the reasons that we kind of just stated, that move was good. They played rook d8. And now we need to um, go in for the kill, more or less. Um, if we think about just this quadrant where the king lives, how is that looking for our um, attackers to defenders ratio right now? Looking pretty good. I'd say so. Um, how many pieces do we have able to join the attack? So far... By the way, the pawn doesn't count because we can't like move oh. it over to go get them. It's more like restricting the position so it stays attacking okay. in character. Okay, I see five then. Okay, which ones? One, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the queen's more of a conditional five. Yeah. It's like that either one of these guys moves. The rook could be like an even more conditional six. Mm -hmm. If we're going very strict, I'd say three. And the three would be minor pieces. One, two, three. Yeah. But this is still pretty good because they only have one, this bishop on e7, right? So it begins to look very promising. Um, now that being said, we haven't finished our development quite yet, so we're still in that building phase. Is there a way that we could finish development and also improve our attackers to defenders ratio? But if it's improving the ratio, mm -hmm. then I guess I would want to move the queen into the same diagonal as this bishop. Hmm. Well, if you do that, how are you ever going to get the bishop involved? That's true. Yeah, it's more. It's a guideline. It's good not to take it too literally. Um, but think about it. That bishop's the only defender. We haven't developed our bishop. We want to yeah. attack on the king's side. Okay, then I think I'll just go in with one of these knights, or like what do you just think? go straight for g5. Okay, any of these are all reasonable moves, but let's yeah. decide between them. Which one do you think is is the best? Uh, I guess the bishop, because I'm both escaping from the queen attack, which I guess doesn't really matter since it's supported by two rooks. Yeah. And also, I'm attacking the bishop, so it has to do something. Yeah, that's the main thing, that mm -hmm. we are using a bishop that hasn't moved yet, and we're eliminating their only defender. Mm -hmm. They have to react. So, bishop g5 is it. This is a move that I think probably deserves an exclamation point, although it's nothing really spectacular. This is almost an automatic move. Um, but it's really good for learning purposes, you know, to see that taking a piece that's not doing anything and trading it for a piece that's doing a lot, even if they're the same piece, like they're exact, exactly the same kind of bishop and everything, right? Um, this is a good move. Something we want to do. In the game they took on g5, um, probably that's the most advisable thing they could do. It turns out their position's already quite poor because if, if they ignore it, like if they go here... Um, and there's no rook. Yeah, we can just take the rook. I, I was contemplating if I should play rook c1 first and then take it for free. That might actually be better. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah, I think this, this looks even better. Probably they have to do something very passive to defend, and then we don't have to worry about knight d3 ever again, and then we can go, go get this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is probably how it goes down. So this would be a big mistake. They really have to acknowledge this. And I imagine they were feeling a lot of pressure because after a move like bishop d7, first of all, rook c1 is still there. Once that bishop is out, our development is like way ahead of them. Um, but second of all, this bishop is hanging. So we can just go, go ahead and take it for free. So th these are all consequences of their like poorly placed bishop on c8. Otherwise, they could get the rooks in the game. And also their pawn structure. If they could bring this bishop and put it right here, they would be fine. We would not have no attack whatsoever. But because of their early decisions on move two, um, yeah. it's not possible. That doesn't mean that it's absolutely bad that they played e6, but it means that when, when we see a move like that, which restricts their mobility, we might think about, you know, it's like, not I'm not going to attack them right now, but it's a possibility, so I want to keep that alive. And if they make further mistakes, an attack could actually occur. So they traded, and I took with this knight, because I want to keep the protection on that square. And another reason, this knight was interfering with our light squares. So if we can 
clear that up, that might be useful. They played queen e7. Trying to keep an eye on that knight, I suppose. Um, now, how do we continue the attack? This is the part where we have to be pretty accurate, because if they can chase our knights back, it's all really for nothing. We need to stay ahead in development. I kind of like my knights where they are. I, I think they're pretty good too. Especially the one on g5. Mm -hmm. And then the queen is getting very close to the action, but isn't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. The knights are preventing that. Yeah, so then would I go to queen e4 just to threaten the attack on h7? How would they react? If we try to keep this as like a, a two move idea, what will occur next? Probably G6. Right. Uh, I think it's forced, actually. Okay. Uh, so they'll play G6, and then what's our follow-up? Otherwise, this is just like a one-off thing. <laughs> so then that's there, and then I would probably want to... Where are their weaknesses? Yeah, I'd say those are the main weaknesses, especially h7, because their bishop on c8 is the main piece that could defend that effectively, and it's super far away. Yeah. Uh, I kind of want to move my bishop here, but then it's just going to get... Yeah. You... Mm -hmm. Do you mean a move one or after queen e4? Uh, after queen e4. Okay. But, I mean, it's, it's also entirely possible to just take... No, I can't, because nope. then there's a... <laughs> That's a good thing to notice, though, because if you can make their queen move, you could always at least cash in for the knight. Um, but I wouldn't get distracted. Like, the attack is pretty important. So queen e4, g6, I'll play arrows, just so we can, like, pseudo-visualize it. Um, is there a way that you can attack that weakness on h7 more than you are right now? The g6 blocks the bishop and the queen very well. So we'll have to go around it somehow. Yeah. Oh. Um. Does it make sense to move the other knight? But I, I feel like I don't want to because then it's no longer protecting this knight. Yeah, oh, I, th I think you would lose your knight on g5 if you did that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I also want to highlight that now that our development is done, it's okay to start moving pieces over and over again. You know how I always say like in the openings, like, eh, why don't you get your other pieces out? Well, the, yeah. the, ti the time has come. You know, like, once we've d done all of that, we have to start improving them. So even though we just moved our queen, we could move the queen again. We could. Yeah, is there a better spot for it now that they've played g6? Oh, h4? Yeah, this is, uh, this is one idea, right? This is a two-move idea. Once I see queen e4, g6, h4, I feel pretty good about this position. Because I have more ideas, like I can just keep going after this. Um, it's not like a one and done thing and then I have to think again about what to do. Also, g6 provokes a weakness. Because you'll remember, we said, as the pawns move farther away around the castled king, the structure becomes more weakened. And it depends on where the pieces are. Like, if you have a pawn on g6, you'd like to have a bishop on g7, because it would protect the weakened dark squares around g6, right? Yeah. But that bishop has been gone. So that's how we know it's good to provoke g6. So, okay. this is what I did. Queen e4, g6, and queen h4. Mm -hmm. um, one thing they would want to do, maybe, is clear away for the queen to protect h7, but there's a problem with that. Let, let's say they play f6, just for sake of argument. It's a bad move. How do we beat this? Just take with the pawn. Okay, and let's say they take back. Yeah, then then uh, it's mate in one, then queen... No, it's not mate in one. Because then the king can still escape a little bit. Yeah, it could escape. Okay, so then uh, would it make sense to just go straight for this? After you take on f6 or before? Yeah, we have a lot of ideas here. Sometimes I like to just take stock. Because then that's, that's like a forced 
queen. Wait, what do you mean? Or well, they can take with the bishop. Yeah. So then, if I were to do this after this, then yeah, I assume the queen would go that way afterwards. I d I don't think so because e six is okay. attacked by the knight, bishop, and rook at that yeah, point. Yeah, true. So they take with oh, the bishop. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then would it be better to take that before? Yeah, you should take on f6 first, but slow down at this point. So you want to take here, they're going to take back. Let's just slow down and see what other options you have. You don't have to take on e6. It seems like you immediately launch into figuring out if taking on e6 is okay, but you have other options that might be clearer than that. I like to do the like magic three candidate moves. Like three is sometimes a good number. Like I can't tell you why it's three, but if you think of at least three ideas, you're probably pretty close to like the three most important, like the best eigenvectors of this position, you know? Sure. Yeah, so I can see taking with this one, but then Which one? I didn't see it. Um Oh the knight. No, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, I mean, the queen's out of the way right now, so, like, one of the things that I am most tempted to do is just go for a check. Uh-huh. Do you feel like you're winning once you play those moves? Like, we take on f6, then we take on h7? You don't have to see to the end, but, like, how's, how's the position seem to you? Promising? Either way, it looks like I'm going to be up on material. Yeah, I think you, you can play it without too much thought, right? Worst case scenario, like even if like this is this is not the best move, it's a winning position, right? They have to go here, and um, I think I would probably choose something like knight e6. Yeah. Because it's check, so we know like what they're gonna do on the next move. We don't have to think too hard. Um, they probably have to take this, and we could always take back like with the rook or with the bishop. This is very very threatening, so like why not? There. You know, everything seems good. We could we could take this one, so we could take on g6 if we want to. Um, the world is your oyster once you get this position. You can play the first move and then figure out the rest later. But I also want to point out that you could also take this knight for free. This is another kind of simple. Oh, okay. It's not like simple attack, but it's yeah. big material advantage. Yeah. These, these kinds of things, it's not too complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have all the same weaknesses. If they were sacking a piece, but like to get the attack on you instead, then I'd be a little bit wary, but it's changed nothing. They're just down. So f6 is a big blunder, so they played h5. This is a critical moment, because if they can maintain this pawn on h5 and then start trading pieces, the attack is really gone. Like, their structure's not that bad that they should lose on the spot, um, if they can just, you know, trade queens, for example. So what are we going to do here to... Um, break through and keep the attack going. Oh, um, the weakness is still h7, by the way. Yeah. Even though it's off limits right now, we still want to go after that spot. So do we just take more attackers to that spot? Like how? What do you think? Um, Speed is key, so we have to pick a fast, fast way to get in. I don't see anything super fast, but I can see that um, maybe the bishop has a way to do it in like a few moves, but none of the bishop's moves currently look very safe, the ones that are going to take it closer to that position. Yeah, I, I have to agree. Like, if I wanted to bring the bishop in, I would probably play something like a3, yeah. so that they have to play like, I don't know, knight d5, and then you play bishop c2. But otherwise, if I wanted to crack open this file, <laughs> then maybe this. Yeah, g4 is the move, actually. Because they don't have a reasonable move right now. They still haven't even finished their development. Like, they'd want to play bishop d7, but when you play g4, mm -hmm. they cannot play bishop d7. You're going to take on h5. And under, under pressure, my opponent blundered and lost immediately in this game. Because um, this, is, this is hard to deal with. If, if they take here, then it's checkmate in two. Can you give the variation? It's 
is, of course, the move that I want to make the mm -hmm. first. Then, then they'll scoot after over. That king's forced over here. Mm -hmm. And then, I guess I just move it one more. Exactly. Kind of. That's it. <laughs> so you're right. No trick here. We just go there and there, and that's it. So they can't take it. And they also can't guard h5, because again, their bishop is on c8 still. Their pawn on e6 is blocking the way. They could go there in one move if they didn't have a pawn on e6, if we didn't fix it by playing e5. So they have all these problems that stem from that, and we're highlighting all of those. g4, and they played king g7. And there's a move here for white that is very good, and they resigned on the next move after this. It's not checkmate, but like they're going to lose a lot of material. I mean, I think I still take here. This is this is still very good, but yeah. I think their idea for counterplay is to bring the rook and defend. Okay. So let's not play along with their their idea. They want to make it complicated. There's a simple win. Okay. Probably that's also winning, but we don't have to entertain them. I definitely don't want to sacrifice my queen randomly. No. You're like, queen h5, yes, outstanding move. <laughs> my favorite. I love giving up my queen after a long and successful campaign against the king. <laughs> uh... Well, think about what the tactical targets might be. Do they have any hanging pieces? Any weak, weak spots? Pieces that are attacked zero times and defended zero times are still hanging pieces, by the way. Don't forget about right. that. So this is defended once. Right, defended once, attacked zero. But still could be at some point. It's not wrong to consider it. This is being defended zero. That's pretty important. Yeah. Okay, so... I'm trying to find a move that, like, directly targets the queen. Yeah, are there any pieces geometrically aligned with the queen? This Already. One. There's that one. Yeah. How easy do you think it is to clear away those two pawns? Not that hard, I guess. So, well, should... Remember, we have to clear both of them, not just theirs. Yeah. So if they take there, I think they'll play, um, maybe bishop takes, let's, let's pretend. So then they take, bishop takes. Yeah. And then if I do that, then he's in check. Mm hmm So I guess... But they can save the queen and the king at once. Yeah. Queen goes forward one. And then... Yeah, I'm not sure how to clear away this pawn then. Yeah, that's not quite working. But you did hit on something important. When you move the knight, the queen is hanging. So what if we just focus on that idea? Like, no no bishop e6 at all. Oh, okay, so then I'll just do that, I okay. guess. Okay. Oh, well, yeah, and then it, I have this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If they take with the queen now, the bishop is still there, so they just lose. Yeah. So I played 96 and they resigned on the spot. It's like, I can't do this. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a really good example, in my opinion, even though it doesn't end with, like, a checkmate or, like, a flash and a bang. Like, there's this logical buildup of the attack and then once the attack is about to convert to a checkmating attack and like just finish them off, they falter because they're under so much pressure. Which goes with the point that I made last time, that when people are defending, they usually underperform. It's just psychologically difficult to manage an attack. Okay, makes sense. I've also put a couple more examples in this study from my games. Um, this next game, um, let me see. Yeah, this is a game where my opponent showed up told me he was 1500 even though he was 1800 and then I crushed him like he was 1500 so this one will probably be good for you to watch uh, okay. I, pu I put some comments in it yeah. Um, yeah that one will be good I can just show the opening a little bit um, 
I played this like Austrian attack type thing against another opening where they have very little space because they let me play e5. That's a common theme. Um, and then this last game, um, let me see what happened in this one. I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah, I was playing black, and I kind of forced my opponent to castle in a situation where I would then launch a huge attack on the queen side where they had castled. So. This one is interesting because they, they weren't castled already, but they had no choice. So it's it's kind of a mix of like pressure in the center and pressure on the castled king. So you can check those out. By the way, the opening here is Scandinavian defense, so you might get some ideas for like when you're seeing this opening a little bit. Oh, I've seen this many times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the the chess.com DGENs do this all the time. Yeah, for some reason it, it remains popular always. Um, yeah. There are some recent new developments at the top level, but I don't think anyone has started implementing them, so we'll see. I don't know. No, I think they're just like, ooh, uh, my queen comes out early. My and then queen. I get to the queen. Yes. <laughs> Alrighty, well, I think this is where we can wrap up, and I'm going to make a worksheet for you. Maybe I'll put some examples from these two extra games on the worksheet, so cool. you can look forward to seeing that. Alright, All right. I'll stop it now. Thank you. Thank you.